G'day everyone, welcome to the Bamboo History Podcast. I'm your host Stephen, and yeah, let's get straight into it. Today's episode is the second part of the two-part series on the War Call, spelt W-O-K-O-U. The War Call were the East Asian pirates that ravaged the seas between the 14th and the 16th centuries. Yar. For those who missed out on part one, I'll do a brief recap. The War Call pirates can be split into two waves. The first wave of War Call piracy occurred in the 14th century and were mainly Japanese people who were suffering from drought and war in their home country and decided to pillage the Korean coastline to make a living. The second wave of War Call piracy began in the 16th century and it happened mainly because the Ming government, in order to control trade, banned private trade through a series of maritime sea ban policies, known in Chinese as Hai Jin. This messed up the livelihoods of many people living on the coastlines who relied on trading and fishing to survive. Hence, many of these people, most of them Chinese, turned to piracy. This leads us to today's episode, where a resurgence of pirate activity began with the largest group of pirates being led by a merchant-turned-pirate lord named Wang Zhi, spelt W-A-N-G-Z-H-I. This period of pirate activity has been traditionally known as the Jia Jing War Call Raids, because it happened during the reign of the Jia Jing Emperor. Between the years 1551 to 1560, Wang Zhi alone led the War Call on 467 separate raids, which averages out to around 50 a year. And this didn't include other pirate groups. The government's response was to respond with force. Back in the year 1548, an official named Zhu Wan, Zhu Wan spelt Z-H-U-W-A-N, had destroyed a large base on an island named Shuangyu, spelt S-H-U-A-N-G-Y-U, and almost caught the great pirate king, Wang Zhi. But after a few years, Zhu Wan was purged by political rivals. The main reason for this was because he had executed a group of pirates without authorization from his superiors. This gave his rivals an excuse to purge him. Reportedly, these rivals had connections with war call pirates, and my assumption is, they, they bribed these government officials to get rid of Zhu Wan. In the year 1550, Zhu Wan was executed and his death left a power vacuum in southeast China, and there was no leader left in the Ming military to fight the War Call pirates. This was a big reason why the War Call, led by Wang Zhi, began a rampage on the southeast Chinese coast. And how did the pirates gain so much power? Well, I see it this way. If I was a peasant farmer living on the coastlines of China, I couldn't make a living going out to sea because the government doesn't let me. If I stay and try to farm crops, the pirates might come one day and destroy my land and everything I own. So why don't I just join the pirates instead? At least I can get a share of the wealth and bounty. With Zhu Wan out of the picture, the Ming commanders that followed him were bollocks at their jobs compared to Zhu. For example, a man named Wang Yu, spelt W-A-N-G-Y-U, replaced Zhu Wan as the commander, but he was defeated several times by the War Call pirates and was eventually sacked in the year 1554. Several other people were then given the job, but they too also failed. Wow, wow, wow. And for a time, it looked like the pirates would undisputedly rule the Chinese seas. Yarrr. <laughs> but nothing lasts forever. And whilst the pirates would have wanted a happily ever after ending, things were about to change. We will now introduce the two main characters that will turn the <laughs> tide around the pirates. Subtle pun insert, in case you missed it. The first person is the less famous of the two, and in my opinion, 
one of the most underrated heroes in the fight against the pirates. The first person's name is Hu Zhongxian. His name is spelt H U Z O N G X I A N. Hu Zhongxian was born in the year 1512 and was born into a family of scholars and officials, so it was no surprise he would grow up to become one himself. He originally started out as a county magistrate, and he proved himself to be very capable at his job. He impressed his superiors and worked his way up the ranks. One example was that he supposedly laid out the plan that contributed to the Ming army's first major victory against the War Coal Pirates in the year 1555 at Wang Jiangjing. Therefore, when the pirate crisis in Zhejiang province worsened, Zhejiang spelt Z-H-E-J-I-A-N-G. He was appointed as the supreme commander to tackle the War Coal Pirate Crisis in 1556. When Hu Zhongxian became the supreme commander, he decided to take a different path than his predecessors. Instead of organising armies and attacking the pirates head on, he would try and exploit the rivalry between the different pirate lords and create internal conflicts amongst the pirates themselves. His first targets were three pirate lords, Xu Hai, X-U-H-A-I, Chen Dong, C-H-E-N-D-O-N-G, and Ye Ma, Y-E-M-A. Hu Zhongxian already knew that Xu Hai and Ye Ma had a grudge. The grudge was based off a fight between Xu Hai and Ye Ma over a captured slave girl from one of their, ahem, <coughs> business trips. Basically, both of them fought over who had the right to claim this slave girl. So yeah, they both hated each other. Hu Zhongxian approached Xu Hai and convinced him to lure Ye Ma into a trap. And then Ye Ma was arrested by government officials. One down, two to go. Then, Hu Zhongxian tried to convince Xu Hai to betray Chen Dong but it was a bit harder to convince him this time, since he didn't hate Chen Dong as much. Hu Zhongxian then took it to the next level and started giving Xu Hai gifts. Xu Hai probably wasn't too interested at the gifts and scoffed at them. Mate, a PlayStation 5? I could get these things myself by visiting your people with my ships. Why would I need it from you? So Hu Zhongxian then took it up another notch, offering Xu Hai the opportunity to be efficiently pardoned by the government, which meant that he would no longer be pursued forever by the government and be left alone, and probably meant escaping execution if he was ever caught. That's like having five stars removed from you. If you've played Grand Theft Auto, you know what I'm talking about. Hu Zhongxian said to Xu Hai, Mate, you have two choices. We can give you a pardon that will make you innocent. Think about it. That's like getting rid of five stars in Grand Theft Auto. Or, we will buddy destroy you and your men right here, right now. And if we don't destroy you right now, we'll keep trying until we do. Xu Hai, lured by the chance of being cleared of all of his pirate crimes, betrayed Chen Dong and gave him over to the Ming authorities. In a swift move, Hu Zhongxian removed two of the three pirate lords. Chen Dong and Ye Ma's remaining followers were furious at Xu Hai for betraying their leaders. So Hu Zhongxian used that to his advantage to convince them to kill Xu Hai. By the time Xu Hai found out that Hu Zhongxian had stabbed him in the back, it was too late. Hu Zhongxian led his own army, as well as Chen and Ye's pirate crew, and killed Xu Hai in the year 1556. You could imagine Xu Hai's reaction. He would have been like, Mate, Hu, mate, you promised me a pardon. And then Hu Zhongxian would have been like, Sorry, what pardon? You know what I'm talking about. Oh, that. Oh, I was just joking, mate. Ah, ah, okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs> and like that, with a bit of manipulation and deception, Hu Zhongxian removed three powerful pirate lords by the year 1557. This was a heavy blow for the pirate king 
Wang Zhi. And all of a sudden, he was exposed. Hu Zhongxian now locked eyes onto him, saying, Wang Zhi, you, you're next, mate. Being a savvy businessman, Wang Zhi knew that he was now at a disadvantage and sought to negotiate with the Ming government to save himself and his enterprise. Basically, Wang Zhi was like, if you don't kill me, I can tell all the other pirates to stop raiding the coasts. The Ming government was like, hmm, okay, why don't you personally come over to us yourself and we can discuss this in person. (laughs) Totally not a trap at all. It was a trap. When Wang Zhi showed up in the city of Hangzhou in the year 1557, he was apprehended by the government, sent to prison, and in the year 1560, he was beheaded. (laughs) Ha ha, got him! (laughs) Hu Zhongxian's, I guess, soft method of appeasement, negotiations, and a bit of backstabbing sprinkled on top, effectively destroyed the war coal pirate leadership, and this meant the pirates who were once organised and capable of mounting large-scale attacks, fell into disarray. Whilst these blows were decisive, the remaining pirates, seeing how deceitful the government was, realised there was no hope of being pardoned or shown mercy, and they responded with continued raiding on the coasts of Zhejiang. They were angry, and they responded hard. These pirates would need to be destroyed with force, And this, my listeners, is where that second person I mentioned earlier comes into the story. The second person's name is Qi Ji Guang, spelt Q-I-J-I-G-U-A-N-G. Unlike Hu Zhongxian, who is often underrated, Qi Ji Guang is considered a hero, if not the main hero for the fight against the pirates. Qi Ji Guang was born in the year 1528, and he was born into a military family. For generations, the Qi family served as commanders of the Dengzhou garrison on the coast of Shandong in eastern China. And it was no surprise that Qi Ji Guang was also destined to have a career in the military. When he was 17, he became an assistant commander and was tasked with leading troops every year to patrol the Great Wall of China. When he was 26, he was again promoted. This time, he was given 4,000 men to lead, and his job was to protect the coastline from war coal attacks in Shandong. It was during this time that he gained experience and knowledge fighting the war coal, and also gained the discipline required of a military commander. His talents were soon noticed, and in the year 1555, he was deployed to Zhejiang province, hundreds of kilometres of coastline south of the Shandong province where he was originally from. Zhejiang was suffering the brunt of the war coal pirate attacks, and Qi Ji Guang hit the ground running. At that time though, the pirates had built a fearsome reputation through their repeated raids on the Chinese coastline. They were ruthless, manic, and skilled in combat, especially the hired Japanese mercenaries. As I mentioned in last week's part 1 episode, the Japanese mercenaries were former samurai who spent most of their lives playing with swords, and hence they were pros when it came to fighting. The Ming army knew this about the pirates, and this became evident in one of Qi Ji Guang's first encounters with the pirates. In the year 1556, Qi Ji Guang led an army of 10,000 men to fight just 800 war coal pirates. Looking at the numbers, 10,000 to 800, it was obvious that the Ming army was going to win. But the Chinese soldiers all started pissing their pants and started to run when they saw the pirates. They were like, oh my god, it's the pirates! Ah, run! Qi Ji Guang was shocked at this and it was like, what the f- Don't run away, you guys! Ugh, sometimes you gotta do everything yourself and then showed what a bloody legend he was, and he jumped onto a rock, fired three arrows with his bow, and struck three of the pirate leaders dead. The other pirates, seeing how their leaders got struck down so easily, panicked and ran off, and Qi Ji Guang single-handedly turned that battle around. But he knew that the soldiers he had were useless, because psychologically, 
they weren't prepared to fight the pirates, because they were so scared of the pirates' reputation as fearsome and ruthless people. So Qi Jiguang decided to raise his own army, an army recruited and trained personally by him, an army that would be fearless and merciless just like the pirates. So in the year 1559, Qi Jiguang arrived at a small town in Zhejiang called Yi Wu, spelt Y-I-W-U, to recruit locals there to join his army. Listeners might wonder, why did he choose this small town in particular? It was said that Qi Jiguang had heard that the people from Yi Wu were fearless and courageous, and were aggressive by nature, beating the horse poo out of any outsiders who threatened their lands. In addition, as Yi Wu was a coastal town, my bet was that there were many locals there who had been personally affected by the pirate attacks. You know, for example, they had a family member who was killed or something like that. So fighting the pirates would have been personal for most of the people in Yi Wu, and this would have been a great morale booster. The people of Yi Wu wanted revenge. They wanted the blood of the pirates. Yarrr. And Qi Ji Guang would give it to them. In total, Qi Ji Guang recruited 4,000 people, most from Yi Wu, and formed his own army. These recruits had never fought before. Some were labourers, others were farmers, and some perhaps had never even held a weapon before. But with a new army, Qi Ji Guang had a clean slate to work off. He began training these rookies, and this is where boys became men. His training regime focused on three things, discipline, martial arts, and education. Training under Qi Ji Guang wasn't like monkeys in a circus, he was really strict. I managed to grab hold of a peasant farmer who was training in General Qi's camp and was able to interview him. The farmer gave me a harrowing account. Man, Stephen, training is tough. Every morning we're forced to wake up super early, then the general starts organizing us into small groups and we practice battle formations? These battle formations, the general says, will be useful fighting the pirates, who he says are fierce but disorganized in battle. Before I joined, I didn't know anything, mate. I've only held shovels, hoes, and pickaxes, but now I know how to fight and hold weapons. Yeah, it's been tough, but I reckon we're a tough army unit now. Qi Ji Guang led his army, his boys, and began defeating the war cult beginning the year 1560, and won key battles in cities such as Taizhou, T-A-I-Z-H-O-U. Qi Ji Guang's personally trained army is known in Chinese as Qi Jia Jun, meaning literally Qi's family army. His personally trained army was strong because they were skilled in battle formations. The most famous of these battle formations was a formation called the Yuan Yang Zhen, or known in English as the Mandarin Duck Formation. The Mandarin Duck Formation's secret was that a duck whack, 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 threw mandarin oranges at the pirates, scaring them away. <laughs> uh, I wish that was true. No, I was just joking. Um, the formation was actually 12 men, with 4 spearmen who had really long spears, 2 men with sabres and shields, 2 men with um, wolf brush spears, which were spears apparently that had multiple blades that looked like brushes, and then two men with short-range weaponry like swords or tridents. The remaining two people was a cook slash porter, who was literally there to give them sustenance and food and supplies and all that, and a leader to lead the squad. The war call pirates were strong in individual combat, but they didn't use formations and were disorganized in attack, preferring to charge at their enemies head-on and in melee style, so when they met this Mandarin duck formation, they got absolutely destroyed. The spearmen's long spears would be able to take some of the pirates out, but if any pirates got closer past those spears, the men with the shields moved forward to protect the spearmen, whilst the wolfbrush soldiers would entangle the pirates with those wolfbrush spears. This gave the time for the others to finish off the pirates. 
the sword and trident men would then act as cover for the rest of the soldiers. Then finally, the cook slash porter would throw rice and mandarins at the pirates, with the mandarins being the ultimate weapon. <laughs> I will share an image on my Instagram of this famous mandarin duck Yuan Yang Zhen formation for you all to check out. After defeating the war call at Zhejiang, Qi Jiguang headed south to the Fujian province, F-U-J-I-A-N, in the year 1562, where he continued to defeat the war call, destroying three major pirate bases in Fujian within months of arriving. The final major battle came in the year 1563 for Qi Jiguang, where he led 6,000 men and defeated a war call force that was around 20,000 at a place called Xianyou, spelled X-I-A-N-Y-O-U. This was the last major battle between the Ming army and the War Cult, who by now were fading fast due to their continued defeats against Qi Jiguang and the Ming army. In the year 1567, the Jia Jing Emperor died, and his son, the Longqing Emperor, Longqing spelt L-O-N-G-Q-I-N-G, ascended the throne. The Longqing Emperor reversed his father's policy and lifted the Haijin Maritime Sea Ban policy, allowing private trade to be conducted legally with foreigners and foreign countries. By letting people trade and make a living on the seas, this meant there were ways to make an honest living, rather than spend a life on ships and going into a life of crime to earn a living. Hence, the Longqing Emperor's reforms brought the second major wave of war call piracy to an end. A takeaway, and hopefully a lesson to all you keen historians on the study of history, is how Hu Zhongxian and Qi Jiguang have been portrayed in Chinese history. Hu Zhongxian has largely been forgotten, whereas Qi Jiguang is revered and celebrated widely in China. But in my opinion, both men were important in defeating the pirates, and Hu Zhongxian perhaps even more so, because he was responsible for the head pirate Wang Zhi's downfall, and was also the supreme commander of the Ming army, as well as Qi Jiguang's superior commander. Yes, Qi Jiguang's personally trained army was super effective against the pirates, but training a personal army wasn't usually allowed by the government, because they would only be loyal to the commander training them and not to the government so personally training an army would have needed special approval. Guess who approved Qi Jiguang's plan to create his own army? Yeah, you guessed it, his superior officer, Hu Zhongxian. If Hu Zhongxian had not approved Qi Jiguang's plan to recruit and train his own army, his army would not have existed in the first place, and we probably wouldn't have seen the victories that he scored later on against the pirates. So that begs the question, why was Hu Zhongxian ignored in history, and what can his snub teach us? Whilst Hu Zhongxian did a great job defeating the war cult, his political alliances somewhat tarnished his reputation. To make it simple to understand, as a politician, in order to move up the ladder, it's important to make powerful friends up top who could back you. Hu Zhongxian's friend up top in government was an official named Yan Song. Yan Song spelt Y-A-N-S-O-N-G. Yan Song was infamous for being a really corrupt official. So when he was ousted by his political rival, Xu Jie, spelt X-U-J-I-E. And yeah, when he was purged, Yan Song and his associates, including Hu Zhongxian, were portrayed in a negative light. Hence, if you read official history texts, like the Ming Shi, they reluctantly acknowledge Hu Zhongxian's contribution to the fight against war coal piracy. Xi Jiguang, on the other hand, was good friends with Xu Jie, and later on another official named Zhang Zhuzhen, and hence was able to preserve his reputation. I really like the saying, history is written by the winners, and it's definitely the case here. My conclusion then is that whenever we read history, we can't just look at it on face value and come to conclusions like, oh, just because this book says he's evil, then he's evil. 
We must question why. Why is this person evil? Why do writers portray them like that? By asking these questions and trying to find out the answer, we can seek to have a more informed and balanced opinion on certain historical characters and events. Before I go though, I wanted to tell you all what happened to Hu Zhongxian and Qi Jiguang after the pirate crisis. Hu Zhongxian, as mentioned above, was purged politically after the downfall of his friend Yan Song and reportedly committed suicide in prison in the year 1565. Qi Jiguang, meanwhile, was reassigned to the Great War of China, where he helped rebuild large sections of the Great War, including the section at Ba Da Ling, which is actually currently the most visited part of the Great Wall in China today. Unfortunately for him though, it was said that he lived his last years in poverty after he retired and died in the year 1588. (sighs) Sad endings for such great heroes. It's really a shame. So yeah, that was it. That is the end of the two-part special series on the famous war cult, East Asian Pirates. I know it might have been a bit long for some of you, but I hope it was informative and that everyone learnt something new. I certainly did. Before you all go, I encourage everyone to either reach out to me on Instagram or email and to also make a review on my podcast so I can get some feedback to improve my podcast for later on. My details will be in the description box below. <clears throat> so now for the last time. Yar, me hearties. Time to set sail now. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, and I'll see you all next time on the Bamboo History Podcast. Bye for now. Yarrr.